Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It was a cold day in June. I hurried home after my shopping, which had left my spirit high and wallet empty. It was dark, the shadows overlaying each other as I drove down my street and into the driveway. It was chilly and I was very hungry, having resisted the junk food and ice cream stores on the way home. Somehow, the mounting hunger made me irritable on the way home. Just as I stepped out of the car, a sudden dazzle hit my eye. A torrent of light had capsized upon the house and I felt the glow of a thousand suns cascading upon me. The glaring white blinded my eyes. I dropped the shopping tote bags around me and shielded my eyes from the deluge. I stood still, panic-stricken. Looking up, I saw a fascinating sight. Once the bright flash had gone, there, crashed in the field opposite my house, was a UFO. It was an exact replica of the ones in comic books and fiction movies, so I couldn't possibly have mistaken it for anything else. And sure enough, my eyes wandered around the craft to see if any aliens emerged. At the same instant, I felt a tug at my pants leg. I was wonderstruck at the sight of an alien, very humanoid in appearance, and of course he was sea green, as they were always portrayed, and he stood there with his strange, enormous eyes straining to see me, eyelids fluttering as though he were myopic. His eyes were watery with rainbow shades floating in them very strangely, and I felt magnetized. He wore what appeared to be a glowing silver metal helmet, but heck, that might have actually been his head for all I knew. The inevitable antenna, like the two tentacles found on the head of a snail, glimmered and shone in fluorescent shades of green and red as though they were traffic lights. Somehow my fascination overcame my fear, and I just kept staring at this little intruder of my world. His head was mango-shaped, and his mouth widened and contracted on and off in a perpetual grin that stretched wide to right behind his head. I was somewhat relieved he wasn't scaly, like some of them lizard people from the comic books. I'm not sure where the courage came from, but I found myself nervously speaking out loud. Hello? The alien nodded, as though in acknowledgement, but not really. He was constantly nodding, even when I hadn't spoken to him. Since he seemed to be of a congenial temperament, I grew braver and extended my hospitality by asking him if he needed food. He grinned and nodded, but then he was always doing that, so I doubted he understood me. I softly tapped him in the stomach to indicate food in belly, but was surprised to find his stomach sounded very metallic, though it didn't look it. It was almost a metal drum sound. Unfazed, still he repeated the grin and nod. By now I was kind of enjoying this strange encounter, concluding he wasn't harmful, and I really wished to communicate with him. I was afraid he might take off abruptly, as it always happened in the movies I'd seen. I tapped his tummy again and said, Food? I made a chomping sound, as if I was munching away. Grin, nod, grin, nod. Drink! And I made a gulping sound. He stared, bewildered, the rainbow hues swirling wildly in his eyes. I was transfixed at the sight, for it was a truly spectacular sight. I picked up a sparkling water I'd picked up while shopping from one of my bags and opened it. I offered this to my alien friend. Grin, nod, grin, nod. So I tried a small bag of nuts I had in my breast pocket, then a stick of gum. Nothing but grinning and nodding. Words like fridge, lunch, or rice made absolutely no sense to it. When I next tapped his tummy, I heard some static sounds, as though he were a goofed-up radio. A few beeps followed and the antenna on his metal head flashed tiny lights. I just stood there asking myself if I was having a psychotic episode. 
Or was it a psychic episode? Have I turned paranormal? The brightly lit UFO appeared to have crashed in the field beyond, and like all the UFOs I'd seen in movies, its lights dimmed and it just sat there like an enormous dark shadow in the background. A few serial lights flashed on and off to remind us of its presence. I gestured for my friend to come into the house. I took a few steps forward and began climbing the few stairs that led from my driveway to the porch. I was amazed and happy to find the alien had grabbed onto one of the tote bag handles as I had lifted them to take them inside. He slid in with me and floated up the stairs. His every move fascinated me. I just had to slow down and watch his every move. I couldn't understand how he mobilized without legs or feet. However, he stopped moving once we were on the porch. He turned himself to face his spacecraft and emanated a few of his beeps and static sounds. I heard a soft crackle from the craft in answer. The alien turned around a full circle, grinning and nodding nonstop, and looked me straight in the eye. Two pinpoints of light, like keen daggers, pierced mine. He then did to me what I had done. He prodded my stomach with his spindly fingers a few times and let off more static sounds. He then turned toward the spacecraft, floated down the three stairs as though he were a spirit, and swish, disappeared into the spacecraft. More lights, more beeps, more crackling sounds, a big whoosh, and I was left there on my porch, alone with my thoughts and thoroughly perplexed. Our close encounter had been less than two minutes, but upon his disappearing I found myself feeling his absence. I actually missed him. Her. It. I wandered into my house like a zombie and looked out the window to see a tiny spot twirl and vanish like it always did in my books. That's when I passed out. I woke up later in a hospital bed. My nurse gave me my breakfast, but hunger evaded me. I'd lost all appetite. I asked about my alien. You can imagine what kind of reaction that received. They gave me a pill to make me doze off again. When I woke up the second time, I still felt no hunger and refused all food. Everyone was worried because I hadn't eaten for three days. Then four. Then five. Six, said someone. Seven, said someone else. Eight, said my wife loudly. And then I awoke. This time, for real. It was eight in the morning. I'd overslept. And here I was, missing an extraterrestrial friend whom in reality I'd never met and never existed. And I still had to go shopping. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the podcast, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Coming up in this episode, falling in love is a beautiful thing, unless doing so sparks a murder spree. If BJ and Erica had never met, several people would still be alive today. But first, claims of dead aliens being hidden in secret locations are a staple of UFO lore, even in the United Kingdom. But can those stories be believed? We begin there. While listening, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com you can sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies for free. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, 
and come with me into the weird darkness. Ooh, here it comes, my favorite part. Have you ever noticed that when George Bailey is on the bridge, it doesn't start snowing again until after he says, Aw, oh, man, the power's out. No problem, because you're prepared with the Patriot Power Generator from 4Patriots. While the rest of the city is dealing with the weather outside is frightful, you can have the power that's so delightful inside your home. Flip the switch and suddenly you're back to the TV and radio for weather updates, your space heaters are keeping you toasty warm, your phones and laptops are charged, your fridge is still running, and you're back to watching It's a Wonderful Life in time to hear Attaboy Clarence. The Patriot Power Generator has zero fumes, so you can use it indoors. And it's solar, so if the outage lasts a while, you're still good to go. Grab a Patriot Power Cell CX, too, and everybody can charge up at the same time. Don't let the unexpected put your family in danger. Grab a Patriot Power Generator today at 4Patriots.com slash weird. That's the number 4Patriots.com slash weird. Free shipping for orders over $97. Have a merry little Christmas, not a scary little Christmas. Visit 4Patriots.com slash weird for the Patriot Power Generator, the Patriot Power Cell CX, and more. That's the number 4Patriots.com slash weird. Weird. A few days ago, we looked at several supposed cases of crashed alien spacecraft and how they probably were not actually extraterrestrial in origin. The article was written by Nick Redfern, and this episode, he's back to tackle the subject of supposed dead extraterrestrials being hidden in the United Kingdom. That was the question put to Nick Redfern in late October 2020 while doing a radio interview. He admits he's probably not the best person to give a positive response on that same question. After all, he's written books on the Roswell Affair of July 1947, one titled the Roswell UFO Conspiracy, which show why aliens didn't crash on the Foster Ranch, Lincoln County, New Mexico. I'll place a link to that book in the show notes. Up until around 2001, Redfern was a true believer in Roswell. That soon changed, however, and to a significant degree. His view is that if Roswell, the most credible UFO crash case for many, turns out not to have alien origins, then what chance is there for the other, lesser credible cases? He says with all assurance, though, that there are claims of dead aliens on ice in well-guarded facilities in the UK, but we need far more than mere claims. Right now, though, that's all we have. I'll begin with a strange story that dates back decades and that involved a famous journalist who died under controversial circumstances. Dorothy Kilgallen was an investigative journalist who died in 1965. When she was doing extensive research into the JFK assassination of November 22, 1963. It's the 1950s we need to focus on, though. While on vacation in 1955, Kilgallen and her husband, Richard Colmar, went on holiday to England. While there, she heard a fantastic story. In Kilgallen's own words, penned at the time, I can report today on a story which is positively spooky, not to mention chilling. British scientists and airmen, after examining the wreckage of one mysterious flying ship, are convinced these strange aerial objects are not optical illusions or Soviet inventions, but are flying saucers which originate on another planet. The source of my information is a British official of cabinet rank who prefers to remain unidentified. Kilgallen had more to say. She quoted her source as telling her, We believe, on the basis of our inquiry thus far, that the saucers were staffed by small men, probably under four feet tall. It's frightening, but there's no denying the flying saucers come from another planet. Kilgallen had more. The official quoted scientists as saying a flying ship of this type could not have possibly been constructed on Earth. The British government, I learned, is withholding an official report on the flying saucer examination at this time possibly because it does not wish to frighten the public. When my husband and I arrived here from a brief vacation, 
I had no premonition that I would be catapulting myself into the controversy over whether flying saucers are real or imaginary. It's important to note that Kilgallen's informant said the alleged aliens that flew the crashed UFO were probably under four feet tall. The word probably implies that even if the UK government did have a crashed saucer, they didn't actually have dead aliens on ice. And that's where the story ends. Aside from the highly controversial Marilyn Monroe, Kilgallen, and UFOs document that surfaced publicly in the mid-1990s. If you want to see that document, I've linked to it in the show notes. Now, let's take a look at the second case Redfern has on record. I should clarify that he has more than two. The problem is that the additional 12 cases are so vague and of a typical friend-of-a-friend type that they're barely worth addressing. There is, however, one case, a notorious one to say the least, worth looking at. It all went down, quite literally, perhaps, on the night of January 23, 1974, on the Berwyn Mountains, North Wales. Depending on who you ask, what happened was the crash of a UFO and its crew, a secret military experiment, an earthquake that occurred at the same time as a meteor shower, or sightings of what have become known in ufology and Fortiana as ghost lights. But what about the dead aliens angle to all of this? Let's have a look. In 1996, an alleged military whistleblower came forward, claiming that aliens had crashed on the Berwyn Mountains back in January 1974. The pummeled bodies of the dead crew were said to have been secretly rushed to Porton Down, a secure facility in the southwest of England that has worked in the fields of chemical warfare, biological warfare, and hallucinogens, for hasty examination and even hastier preservation. As is so typically often the case in such situations, the source of all this chose not to provide his name to the UFO research community of the day. Instead, he preferred to lurk in the darkness, shrouded in mystery and intrigue. He shared his story only with the late Tony Dodd, who was a North Yorkshire police sergeant and UFO investigator, in the book Alien Investigator, which I've linked to in the show notes. Dodd chose to give his talkative soldier the alias of James Prescott, who was said by Dodd to have been long retired from the British Army. There's no doubt that something happened on that night in January 1974, and there's also no doubt that the Prescott story fired up the UK-based UFO research community of that time, 1996. That was the very same time when an X-Files-type I-want-to-believe fever still had a grip on ufology. You only have to look at the names of all the glossy UFO-themed newsstand magazines that hastily hit the newsstands in that era, such as Alien Encounters, Sightings, UFO Reality, The X Factor, Enigma, UFO Magazine, and the list goes on. All of those magazines are long gone. I remember very well the debate and controversy surrounding the Prescott claims in the 1990s. Some UFO investigators were intrigued by it. Others were amazed by it. The fact is, though, all that we have now is all we had back then. An unknown source with a faked name and a UFO researcher, the aforementioned Tony Dodd, who stubbornly refused to reveal the name of his informer, even though he could. For some in ufology, that might be enough to make a case. It's not enough for Nick Redfern, though, and it shouldn't be enough for you either. Of course, no one can never say for sure there aren't any dead alien bodies hidden away in a well-protected underground bunker below the UK countryside. On the basis of the evidence that we have right now, though, we need way more before we can even come close to making such a definitive statement. Another case dates back to the mid-1960s. Christmas was looming in December 1965 when one Kenneth Reese, in the early hours of the morning, hastily told both the UK Ministry of Defense and the Royal Air Force that he saw a bright, globe-like object descend into a valley near Ruthen, North Wales. Notably, the Royal Air Force's records show that Reese said the light fell at an extremely slow pace, which is particularly intriguing and effectively rules it out as having been a meteorite. Reese watched, amazed, the thing for a handful of minutes. 
Then suddenly, and quite out of the blue, it exploded in the valley, leaving nothing behind. The mystery remained exactly that – a mystery. Longtime UFO investigator and author Jenny Randalls told an interesting story in issue 152 of her magazine, Northern UFO News. The time? Some point in 1991. The location? The county of Staffordshire. The source was only referred to by Randalls as M.L. He or she said they encountered something that was silvery, only about 10 feet long and not unlike a missile. We might very well suggest that a missile was exactly what it was, perhaps even one that had fallen from a military plane. If that was the case, then there's no doubt that a near calamity like that would have been hastily hidden. Intriguingly, only a day later a significant depression was found in the immediate area. Like so many cases of the crashed type, this one was not cleared up. Not to the public, at least. Moving on to 1994, it was time for the people of the village of Church Lynch, near the UK's Cotswolds, to encounter something which fell from the skies. Barrel-like was how the locals described the object from the skies. In no time at all, the military had descended on the scene. Not only that, a cordon was put into place, ensuring that no one without clearance had any chance of figuring out what the hell was going on. The UK's Royal Navy was having their share of the investigation, too. In fact, there was more than that. Within the area, there were rumors that the Navy had quickly scooped up the unknown thing and headed off for… well, who knows where? Not us. It should be noted that the 1965 case can be found in the now declassified UFO files that the UK's Ministry of Defense quietly put together for years and that are now in the public domain. Before getting too excited, however, it should be noted that for the Ministry of Defense, the word UFO means literally what it was – something in the sky that had not been identified. Not necessarily a flying saucer or an extraterrestrial craft. Just some object in the sky that nobody had figured out what it was yet. It's very clear from the available material that the Ministry was not thinking of a Roswell-type affair. Of course, it's all but impossible to say there haven't been any UFO crashes in the UK, and by that I mean the crash of spacecraft from other worlds, but we need to understand that just because the Ministry of Defense had, and still has, files on UFOs is very different to saying that they had the remains of small creatures with large black eyes from a world far away. It's pretty inevitable that if you have been involved in subjects like UFOs, cryptology, and conspiracy theorizing for a long time, as Nick Redfern has, your thoughts, beliefs, and conclusions are going to alter, whether to a mild degree or to a significant degree. For example, had someone said to Nick Redfern when he was 20 that by the time he was in his 30s he would have totally dismissed the theory that aliens crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico in early July 1947, he would have laughed or just outright dismissed them. But the fact is, he did change his mind. Very much the same goes for his opinion on the Rendlesham Forest UFO landing of December 1980. In early 2020, Redfern wrote a book titled The Rendlesham Forest UFO Conspiracy, which I have linked to in the show notes. It presents a controversial scenario, namely that nothing of an extraterrestrial nature occurred there at all. Rather, that it was a series of secret military experiments. And now we move on to what Nick Redfern believes is the ultimate example of mind-changing in the world of UFOs. It's a story that revolves around a man named Gordon Crichton. For years, Crichton was the editor of the once very popular magazine Flying Saucer Review. When he passed away in 2003, none other than the UK's Times newspaper ran an obituary on the man himself. An extract from that same obituary reveals the following. Government service occupied most of the working life of Gordon Crichton, but he perhaps made his greatest mark as an authority on unidentified flying objects. His conviction that extraterrestrials were visiting Earth seemed oddly at variance with the more orthodox worlds of diplomacy and Whitehall. His expertise took him into government research on maps in Oriental and other languages 
with the Permanent Committee on Geographical Names, and he spent eight years as an intelligence officer on Russian and Chinese affairs at the Ministry of Defense. It is said that in the intelligence post he worked, directly below the secret Whitehall Department where the Air Ministry and the RAF were studying information on UFOs. Like so many people who got into the UFO subject in the late 1940s and early 1950s, Crichton strongly believed that the flying saucer phenomenon was the result of visitations to Earth by extraterrestrials from faraway worlds. It should be noted, however, that over time, Crichton's views on the overall mystery began to change. By the latter part of the 1970s, it was very clear to his colleagues that Crichton was edging away from the extraterrestrial theory and towards something very different. And what might that something be? Well, I'm going to tell you. None other than the Middle Eastern Jinn. The late Rosemary Ellen Guiley was an acknowledged expert in the field of the Jinn. Her book, The Jinn Connection, is apparently a collector's item as it lists for hundreds of dollars online. I've linked to it in the show notes if you want to take a look. In her book, Rosemary said, In Arabian lore, Jinn are a race of supernaturally empowered beings who have the ability to intervene in the affairs of people. Like the Greek daemons, Jinn are self-propagating and can be either good or evil. They can be conjured in magical rites to perform various tasks and services. A jinni, the singular of jinn, appears as a wish-granting genie in folk tales, such as in the Book of 1001 Arabian Nights collection of folk tales. Rosemary added, in Western lore, jinn are sometimes equated with demons, but they are not the same. They are often portrayed as having a demonic-like appearance, but they can also appear in beautiful, seductive forms. The jinn are masterful shapeshifters, and their favorite forms are snakes and black dogs. They also can masquerade as anything – humans, animals, ghosts, cryptids, and other entities such as extraterrestrials, demons, shadow people, fairies, angels, and more. Rosemary offered more on the jinn. They are born of smokeless fire, which in modern terms could be labeled as plasma. They live very long lives, but they are not immortal. According to some accounts, they live with other supernatural beings in the calf a mythical range of emerald mountains that encircles the earth. In modern terms, they live in a parallel dimension. For Crichton, all of that amounted to a major change of mind, from aliens to jinn, and no looking back. When Weird Darkness returns, falling in love is a beautiful thing, unless doing so sparks a murder spree. If BJ and Erica had never met, several people would still be alive today. That story is up next. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. BJ was a thuggish, violent, 
ill-tempered bully, while Erica was a highly strung, compulsive, nervous wreck riddled with anxiety. There's an argument made in Phelps' book that if these two had never met, they may never have descended into the chaotic and murderous events that would eventually get them locked up. It would seem that the love that these two had for one another was a ticking time bomb just waiting to explode on the unfortunate souls that they would encounter in their search for the ultimate thrill. It was a week of murder and robbery for this married couple that would ultimately lead to their eventual arrest, trial, and sentencing. Because of the gravity of their crimes, Erica and BJ deserved to rot in their jail cell forever. So it's extremely upsetting to hear that, at the time of this recording, there is consideration underway to release BJ from Roxbury Correctional Institution. It all happened within the vacation getaway of Ocean City, Maryland during the summer of 2002. But the seeds of the crime originally go back to when Erica and BJ married in 1998. Both of them were aged 20. It was a whirlwind romance where they married within a few months of first meeting. Erica didn't fit the mold of your typical spree killer. She was an honors student in high school, and she was totally infatuated with basketball. An obsessive type of person, Erica was known to spend her entire day practicing her free throws. She was a basketball star at Mary Washington College and one of the brightest in her class. According to M. William Phelps in his book Cruel Death, which I've placed a link to in the show notes, as a kid in Roaring Spring, Erica Grace was well-liked and thought of as someone who'd been given things others were never going to get. Every opportunity was handed to her. Benjamin Sifrit had graduated training as a Navy SEAL, but was later discharged for bad conduct before he actually managed to become a SEAL. Sifrit had a string of strikes to his name while in the service, including repeatedly being absent without leave, insubordination, and wearing unauthorized insignia. B.J. had a love of Hitler, as described by Erica. He had a swastika tattooed on his chest, and Erica had told the police during her interview that they both agreed with Hitler's beliefs. As well as the Nazi obsession, B.J. had a number of other strange or eccentric interests which included a love for exotic snakes, a mutual obsession with Hooters paraphernalia, stealing as much tat from Hooters as they could whenever they visited the joints, B.J. was a thrill-seeker that was always on the prowl for the ultimate buzz. After all, what is a bigger buzz than murder? B.J. was extremely hot-headed, as shown in his military record, and Erica had issues of codependency, jealousy, and what would appear to be obsessive-compulsive behavior. Erica was easily frazzled when something seemingly small was out of place. But these issues were boiling on the inside. On the outside, the couple appeared to be a fun-loving and happy-go-lucky young couple. They were seemingly two good-looking, intelligent, and athletic Americans that enjoyed drinking, vacations, and partying. And it was this outer appearance that snagged Martha Crutchley and Joshua Ford into their murderous web. They were charmed by what had appeared on the outside, while on the inside something much, much darker lurked. Two Hearts of Darkness Erica worked hard during early married life. She had her own scrapbook store, which her parents set up for her, and worked her butt off to please BJ. During the early years of their marriage, Erica was infatuated with BJ, the same way she was infatuated with basketball. Erica had an obsessive personality, clinging to whatever she could with a vice-like grip. The warning signs in her husband's psyche were there for any reasonable thinking woman to see, of course, but Erica chose not to see it. B.J. had a swastika tattoo. He had snakes that he named Bonnie and Clyde, Hitler and HIV. He was a frequent drug and alcohol taker, and Erica confided to a friend early in the relationship that she often saw B.J. stealing. Erica had her own disorders, of course. It was said that she had a habit of checking that the upper door was locked nine times and the lower door was locked twelve times every morning. Erica would spend a great deal of her morning twisting the lock over and over and over again to ensure it was locked. B.J. had picked up on these habits and would use them against Erica. He would purposely wait for Erica to get to work, and with the intention of ruining her day, 
While she was at work, BJ would call and ask, Are you sure you locked the door? I think the door might be open. Maybe the oven is on too. It was surely a case of gaslighting, where BJ was trying to ensure he had a psychological grip on the fragile and highly strong Erica. As Phelps said about the couple in his book, Erica's hang-ups fueled the passively sinister character stirring in BJ during the early stages of their marriage. For one, there is no doubt that BJ Sifrit had a death wish. As Erica drifted further from her friends and parents, BJ became more abusive towards Erica, targeting her confidence with comments about her weight, her hair, and, according to Erica, purposely molding me into someone that other men would not find attractive. On top of this, BJ engaged in reckless behavior, including racially antagonizing people that he came into contact with. BJ was also prone to shooting his 357 Magnum out the window of Erica's ride at the passing road signs. The couple were on a one-way collision course. They were two sticks of dynamite just waiting to go off. It was a thrill killing. Erica had come from a wealthy family, and there was no financial need or desire to kill Joshua and Martha. The only need came from knowing what killing felt like. The night started pleasantly for the vacationers. Ford and Crutchley had met the Sifrits on a bus heading towards Secrets Nightclub. Ford had offered to pay for the Sifrits' bus fare, and the two couples spent time at a club together drinking all night. The couples went back to the beautiful rented condo in Ocean City, Maryland, to talk and carry on partying. The dynamic of the night changed when Erica accused the couple of stealing her purse. The tension seemed to rise and rise within the small complex until BJ eventually pulled a gun on the couple, asked them to strip naked, and they then retreated into the bathroom, with BJ locking the door after them. BJ unloaded the gun into the door and then smashed the door off his hinges. It was horror movie stuff. The death scene was vicious, not just for the actual execution of the friendly and amiable mortgage and insurance brokers, but also because of the rising sense of fear and humiliation they must have felt in the buildup. BJ allegedly asked them as they stood naked in front of him, do you want to die? As Erica would later explain to prosecutors, she knew from the moment that BJ started barking orders that the couple were doomed to die. And what did she do about it? Nothing. Joshua was the same as BJ in one respect, a military man, but that's about as far as it goes. Joshua had traveled as far as Korea, had a black belt in karate, and yet never felt the need to flaunt or brag about his toughness. Joshua had tried to ask BJ why he was doing this and tried to calm the situation down without the need for violence. It was typical of his gentle character. Joshua had been honorably discharged from the military in stark contrast to BJ's disgraced exit from the services. What was taking place in that condo was a story of pure evil colliding with two people of genuinely good character, Joshua and Martha. Martha had then grabbed Erica and began pleading for her life, crying that she didn't steal from the Sifrits. BJ locked the couple in the bathroom, pondered on what to do next, and then decided to shoot Joshua four times. Martha was then stabbed to death, and the bodies were dumped on Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. However, it wasn't as clean as just that. There was more to the tale that doesn't even deserve going into detail. What the couple did to the bodies after death is an aberrant sin to the sanctity of the body, which included acts of cutting, sawing, and necrophilia. True depravity. It should again be stressed at this point that these two should never ever, ever see the light of day for the rest of their natural lives. Clearly still buzzing from the murders, they then went and burglarized a Hooters restaurant, this robbery occurring on the 31st of May 2002. They were then caught in the act of the robbery, and the police were stunned to find they were linked to the recent disappearances of Ford and Crutchley. When police searched Erica's purse, they found the driving licenses belonging to their victims. Erica confessed immediately to the murders and pinned the blame all on BJ as soon as she could, without hesitation. Perhaps more cunning and wiser than Erica, BJ had stayed silent, 
only disclosing to the police what he felt was necessary. At trial, the two tried to blame each other for the murders. BJ maintained that he was asleep in the car during the murders and was disgusted to stumble upon the horrific scene while conceding that the dismemberment of the bodies was his idea. There was a key witness in this case, however, that would put the nail in the separate coffin. It would appear that another couple had a similar experience in Ocean City with the Sifrits just days after the first murder and were lucky enough to live to tell the tale. It again occurred after a meeting at Secrets Bar. Justin met the couple there. Melissa Selling and Justin Wright described the living nightmare of their night partying with the Sifrits. At the same condo where the first murders took place, and just a couple days after the first incident, the new couple were invited back for a nightcap. It just seemed another normal party night in Ocean City for Melissa and Justin, at first. While in the bathroom, however, Melissa had noticed the way the door had been taken off the hinges and the small holes in the bathroom door, which she later realized were bullet holes. This and BJ's general hostile demeanor had filled her with a sense of frightened dread and a need to get the hell out of there. Erica then began the hysterics and again claimed that her purse was missing. BJ resorted once again to brandishing his gun and talking of ridding the world of bad people. BJ bragged about the previous murders to Melissa. For some reason, things then just simmered down this time around and BJ went from hot back to cold and began rolling a joint and laughing with Justin. When BJ and Erica went to the bedroom to have sex, Melissa left the party as soon as she could and drove home. Not long later, making her way home, she received a call from Justin and she drove back to pick him up from outside the condo, telling him, I'm not going back up there. It was Melissa's testimony that was vital in convicting the pair. BJ was lucky enough to only receive a conviction for second-degree murder with the eligibility for parole in 2021. The detective on the case, Detective Bernal, has vowed to make sure that BJ serves every day of the 38-year term, stating, I'll be at every parole hearing even if I'm retired. I'll make sure to bring the autopsy pictures. Amazingly, Benjamin Sifrit was acquitted of all charges in the death of Joshua Ford and only received a second-degree murder charge for Martha. Erica had a tougher time of it through the courts and was sentenced to life without parole plus 20 years, Erica received a first-degree murder charge for Ford and second-degree for Crutchley. It seemed that Erica's willingness to talk to the police in stark contrast to BJ's recalcitrance is what guaranteed that she received the harsher sentencing. Other evidences against Erica included the fact that the murder weapon not only belonged to her but was found in her purse. Erica has exhausted all chances through the court to try to appeal the original sentence but it is with great sadness to report that Benjamin could be released as early as 2021. It is hoped that publicity back into the case will stop any release for Benjamin Sifrit. Many have tried to support Erica and paint her as a victim of domestic abuse, suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. And while there may be some truth to this, there is also the fact that Erica not only tried the same crappy act again on another couple, but she had ample opportunity to stop the first murders and didn't. In the words of Phelps, the evidence, if truly looked upon objectively, points directly to Erica's culpability, responsibility, and involvement. And if you look really hard, staying in between the lines of reality, you might even take a stab at saying Erica could have played a larger role in the crime than BJ. And therein lies the potential parallels to Carol Ann Fugate, BJ and Erica were a couple that thrived on movies like Badlands and California, True Romance and Natural Born Killers, so they decided to live it themselves, and now they sit rotting where they belong. After all the thrill-seeking, they now cannot even walk to the market. The greatest thrill they'll get now is their 30 minutes of yard time each day. Long may this remain. The author M. William Phelps, who's written dozens of true crime books, has said this was the toughest case he's had to write about. The sheer depravity of the case is sickening. 
The couple have now been divorced for ten years at the time of this recording, thus ending the tainted love story of the Sifrits. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please, tell someone else about the podcast. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Plus, telling others about Weird Darkness also helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression, so please, share the podcast with someone today. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction? Click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Are Dead Extraterrestrials Being Hidden in the UK? was written by Nick Redfern for Mysterious Universe. A Match Made in Hell is by Kieran W. for Mystery Confidential. And the short fictional story I began the podcast with, The Alien, was originally written by Jayashri Jayapal but rewritten for Weird Darkness by Darren Marlar. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. And a final thought, if it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. It's the hard that makes it great. Tom Hanks from A League of Their Own. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.